Good morning. We are doing things a little bit differently today because after the invitation and after the sermon, we will be having two baptisms. And so in light of the baptisms, we wanted to do communion. I'm getting a little feedback. Yeah. After the baptisms, we'd like to do communion after so that the... Is it, is it the mic here? Or is it just me? I don't know. Anyway, after the baptisms, we like to have communion with those two new members in the body of Christ because I think that is important. In communion, we not only commune with Christ, we commune with one another. Uh, unfortunately, over time, communion has become this very ritualistic, tacked-on thing rather than being a time of fellowship, right? So hopefully, you know, someday I'd like to change that a little bit. Uh, for it to be an actual time of fellowship as it was, was initially. Uh, so I think it's important that we welcome these new members in Christ as we take communion together. So that explains the difference in the, you know, difference in the order of service there. Um, before we get into the sermon, man, I got to tell you, uh, this sermon was very difficult to prepare. <laughs> Sometimes when I, when I get to a text, when I get to a chapter in the Bible, I, I really want to just do the whole chapter because the whole chapter goes together, but at the same rate, I'm like, man, this is going to be like a 40-minute sermon. Probably not going to be a 40-minute sermon, because I'm usually pretty quick, so you don't have to worry about that, but it was difficult. Um, there are some difficult themes. I will tell you this now. There are some difficult things. There are difficult pills to swallow, so in light of that, I would like to pray before we get into the text. God, you are good, and you alone are good. I am thankful that, that you sent your Son, Jesus, the, the Word into the world, the light into the world. I am thankful that we have your, your Scripture that reveals truth to us. And, and sometimes as we read, it's difficult. Sometimes as we read your Word, we don't understand everything. And we don't have to. We know we don't have to understand everything, Lord, but we ask that you'd give us insight, that you'd give us wisdom, that you'd give us guidance. I ask that you would guide my words, it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now, one thing I hope you notice that as we've gone through Scripture, as we've looked at a few different accounts where Jesus heals someone, uh, Jesus heals someone and there's a deeper message, there's a deeper purpose aside from just the healing. Right? We saw this in John chapter 5 with a man who was uh, paralyzed for 38 years, and Jesus heals him and he tells him in John chapter 5, verse 14, John chapter 5, verse 14, he says to the man, there it is, John chapter 5, verse 14, see you are well, sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you. All right, so Jesus, he does amazing things. He heals people, heals all sorts of illnesses and all sorts of physical ailments. Do I need to do something with my mic or my good now? All right. Anyway, Jesus, he heals all sorts of illnesses, he heals all sorts of physical ailments, but he's pretty clear. After he healed this man, he tells him, hey, there's a sin problem. There's a sin problem that affects all mankind, a sin problem that only Jesus can address. And we see something similar in John chapter 9 with a man born blind. Jesus gives this man sight. He opens his eyes, yet there's a deeper meaning, there's a deeper purpose. It illustrates that Jesus as the light of the world opens people's eyes. Let me do something a little bit different. I'm going to just lay out the sermon for you. I don't usually do this. I'm giving away my secrets here. Um, <laughs> but this is the layout of the sermon. PCPW. That's equals a W. All right, I'm not talking about the drug. I'm not talking about your primary care physician. <laughs> this is just the layout of the sermon. That's the, acronym, that's the acronym I landed on. It's a little weird. But anyway, PCP equals W. P, the first P. God has a purpose, then as a result of that purpose, change is going to happen in this blind man's life, and as a result of the change, he will profess Jesus as Lord, and then as a result of the purpose, as a result of the change, and as a result, as a result of the profession, he worships Jesus. So that's the layout of the sermon. I'll go ahead and spoil it for you, but let's go in John chapter 9. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. We're going to take this in blocks. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 7. The text says, As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, 
It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said these things, he spit on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Then he anointed the man's eyes with the mud and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sin. So he went, he washed, and he came back seeing. So the disciples first asked, hey, who sinned? The parents, or did he sin? Right? And this boils down to what is known as retribution theology. It's kind of summed up in the phrase, an eye for an eye. And they took this to an extreme. Essentially, if anything good happened in somebody's life, hey, they must be good, they must be doing good. If anything bad happened in somebody's life, well, you must have done something bad, or your parents must have done something bad. They must have sinned. Now, it's a little bit confusing. Why do you think they say, who sinned this man or his parents that he should be born blind? How could that man have sinned? If he was born blind, when did he have time to sin that he would be born blind? It's a little bit confusing. Uh, now, there's a number of things that people think that maybe is going on here. Uh, some Jews might have had this belief that somebody could have sinned in the womb, thus they were born in a certain way. Some Jews might have believed that. Uh, maybe this has to do with maybe some thought that, hey, God is punishing him for something that he is going to do. Uh, there's a lot of guesses as to what could be going on here, but in the text, in the first block, in verses 1 through 7, the cause is not of most importance. Jesus points out, hey, you shouldn't even be concerned about the cause. Right? Times in life, we can't really know the cause, but what is most important is that God, God can have a purpose even in this man's blindness. God can have a purpose even in the most difficult situations in life. And as I said, this was a difficult sermon to prepare for. God can have a purpose even in terrible situations. God can bring about a purpose even in the midst of when, when there seems to be no hope. This man's blind from birth. Well, what hope does he have? He's blind from birth. Then he would have been viewed as unclean. Then he would not have been welcomed into the synagogue. He would not have been welcomed to worship God. That's why we're going to see why he was sitting and begging. He can't provide for himself. He can't take care of himself. This man has no hope. So you're telling me that even in that situation, God can bring about his purpose. If we're honest, we can think of times in life where, man, God, what are you doing? That's our question. Where are you, God? I don't see you working, God. I don't see how this can come about and how you can uh, bring about your purpose. I don't see how you can open this man's eyes. I don't see how you can make this man's life any better. I don't see how you can make my life any better. Where is your purpose? It's difficult. But that's the implication of the passage. Even in the most difficult of situations, God can bring about his Purpose. And in verse 4, Jesus implies that part of his purpose is what Jesus does, the works that Jesus does, is part of God's purpose. Verse 4 said, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. Now, what does day refer to? Right? What does Jesus mean by we're going to work the works of him while it is day? What is day? Again, the uh, different takes on this. Some people think that Jesus is just referring to the time while he's on earth. So day is while he's on earth until he dies and until he is raised. Maybe that's what he means by day. Maybe Jesus means that it, it's, it's the time leading up to his second coming, right? Maybe that's what he refers to as day, and maybe verse 5 can help us with this. Verse 5 says, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. So if Jesus is the light of the world, then maybe he's referring to himself as day. Thus, we could conclude that, hey, day is while Jesus is on earth and until he dies and until he is raised. That's day. But at the same time, this could still be referring to when he returns again, because we are light. We are extensions of his light. John chapter 12, verse 36. It says, While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light, or children of the light. When Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself 
from them, right? So if we believe in the light, we may become sons of the light. Now, think of this personification of light. If light has children, what are the children? Light. Right? So there's a sense in which we too are Christ's light in the world. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 5. For you are all children of light, children of day. We are not of the night or of the darkness. So maybe there is a sense in which we are still in this time of day because we are an extension. We are a member of Christ's light. Romans 13, verse 12. The night is far gone, the day is at hand, so let them cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. So not only are we are children of light, there's a sense in which we are putting on an armor of light. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 8 through 9 and 13 and 14. For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So there's a sense in which when Christ shines on us, we become a member of that light. We emanate light like Christ. And so when we dwell in Christ's light, we become an extension, we become a member of that. So maybe when Jesus says, hey, while it is day, we've got to do the works of him who sent me, I think he could be referring both to while he's on earth and while the church is still working on earth until he comes again. All right, so while it is day, while the church is still an extension, while the church is still Jesus' light in the world, we do the works of him. All right, so that, uh, that's what I think he's referring to when he refers to today, but the main point of verses 1 through 7. Main point of verses 1 through 7, God has a purpose. God can bring about his purpose even in the most difficult situations. And then verses 8 through 12, we're going to see a change. Verses 8 through 12, it says, The neighbors and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, it is he. Others said, no, but he is like him. He kept saying, I am the man. So they said to them, then how were your eyes opened? He answered, the man called Jesus made mud and anointed my eyes and said to me, go to Siloam and wash. And so I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, where is he? He said, I do not know. So after God's purpose, this man is changed. Right, verse 8, he was a beggar. He probably lived off, lived off of scraps. He probably really couldn't take care of himself. After all, his parents are out of the picture, and we're going to see that later on. His parents are out of the picture. His parents don't care about him. He is alone. He can't take care of himself. His neighbors know this. His neighbors know that, hey, this is the man that used to sit and beg on the streets. Used to. After God's purpose, he's different. He's different. Now imagine, imagine after Jesus healed this man. Imagine after he healed him, this man went back to sitting and begging. How ridiculous would that be? This man had his eyes open. Imagine if he had his eyes open and he could live a totally different life, but he would choose to sit and beg. Man, some people do that. <laughs> they have their eyes opened by Christ, Christ being the light of the world. They know that, hey, th there's life in Christ. There's a new life. There's a life of freedom from sin. But man, I love my life of sitting and begging. I love my sin. Don't touch my sin, Christ. I love being a slave to sin. Don't touch it. <laughs> when Christ as light comes into our life, exposes uh, works of darkness, darkness, man, we cannot just stay the same. It'd be ridiculous for this man who had his eyes open to just stay the same. You see, there's two outcomes. There's really two outcomes, two options. After God brings about his purpose in life, either you will refuse his grace, you'll stay the same way you were, or you will be changed and embrace his grace. This man, he embraces the grace and he is change. Verses 13 through 17. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been blind. Now it was the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes, so the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, he put mud on my eyes and I washed and I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner do such signs? And there was a division, a division among them. So they said again to the blind man, What do you say about him, since he has opened your eyes? And he said, He is a prophet. Often as a result of God's purpose, as a result of the change that happens in your life, you face opposition. There will be skeptics who think, hey, now that God didn't really work in your life. You just think that God didn't really do anything in your life. Now, in spite of this opposition, we see this man doesn't fold. He didn't say, you know what, you might be right. He can't deny it. He can't deny that God had a purpose even in his terrible situation and his life changed. And you see, often when God brings about his purpose and often when there is change in someone's life, they begin to profess. Keyword begin. Often there is a progression in profession. Right? Sometimes somebody, they might be completely closed off to belief in God, but, but then they eventually come to believe in God. Often somebody is closed off to belief in Christ. They don't even think Christ was a real person, but then they come to believe that, hey, maybe Christ was a real person. And then maybe they come to believe, hey, not only was he a real person, but he actually did the things he claimed to do. And not only that, he is Lord. See, sometimes, sometimes there is a progression in profession. So this man, he he saw God's purpose in his life. He changed, and he's starting to profess. But this isn't a full profession yet. Jesus isn't just a prophet. Let's see where he goes, verses 18 through 23. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight and asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he now see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He is of age. He'll speak for himself. His parents said these things because they feared the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone should confess Jesus to be Christ, He was to be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, he is of age, ask him. Not only does he face opposition from the religious elite, right? Uh, These Pharisees who don't buy it, they don't believe that Jesus actually did something in his life. He faces opposition from his family. The people that it should be supposedly the closest to him. And presumably, based on the text, man, they haven't been in his life. This man was born blind, and he's alone. He's sitting and begging, thus implying that his family, his own parents, denied him, cast him out, didn't want anything to do with him. That's tough. And presumably, they probably cast them out because, again, back then, in their time, anybody with a disability... Uh, physical disability, uh, maybe a mental disability. Anybody with a disability then, they were viewed as unclean and they were not allowed to go into the synagogue and to worship God. So his parents were probably trying to distance themselves from that. They didn't want to be secluded from the synagogue. And now as they talk with the Jews, they're trying to save themselves. Like, hey, (laughs) you talk with him, we don't want any part of this. So as he's he's coming to profess Jesus, he's making progress in his profession, and he's facing opposition from his own parents. I'm not going to pretend like I've ever had that difficulty and like that exact difficulty. Um, My parents have never opposed me professing Christ, believing in Christ. Uh, But, you know, there, there was one time when I was considering going to college pursuing ministry, Hang on a second. (laughs) There was one time when I was sitting on the couch and I was talking to my parents about it. And they told me, like, hey, you shouldn't do that. Uh, You need to get a job that's going to actually make you money. (laughs) And so that's not even close to what's going on here. I can think of that and that still hurts me. (laughs) I, I forgive them. I love my parents. They're great parents. I love them. But even the thought of that still hurts me, and I can't imagine this man who was thrown outside to sit and beg. His parents didn't want anything to do with him. 
And then God comes into his life. Jesus comes into his life, brings about his purpose, and this man is changed, and he's beginning to profess Christ. We continue on in verses 24 through 34. Will this man hold on? So for the second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. They're talking about Jesus. Verse 25. He answered, Whether he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? And he answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, Why, this is an amazing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us? And they cast him out. As a result of the, the purpose, as a result of the change, and then this progress and profession, not only does this man face opposition from the teachers of the law and his parents, but it's getting to the point of persecution. Getting to the point of the persecution where they, they cast him out. Right? This man already wasn't able to be in the synagogue, but now that he's healed, he's cast out. As he, as he continues to profess, getting closer and closer to professing Christ as Lord, uh, these Pharisees, really it's the religious people, which is a bit ironic, they want nothing, they want nothing to do with him. They cast him out. Sometimes as a result of our profession, people might cast us out. Now I know in our society, it's, you know, it's not really that big of an issue right now. It hasn't been that big of an issue for a long time. In other parts of the world, it is a big issue. I pray, I pray that God, if there ever comes a time where we are persecuted like that, we will hold on. And look at what he says in verse 32 through 33. As I said, there's a progress in profession here. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Right? So he goes from just saying, hey, maybe this man's a prophet, to saying, there's no one like him. There's no one like him. No one can do what he does. Uh, the only way that he can do what he does is that if he is from God. You can notice his progress. Maybe he's a prophet. There's no one like him. And then finally, a full profession, verses 35 through the first half of 38. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered, and, uh, and he said, And who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. He said, Lord, I believe. He professes belief in Christ as the Son of Man. And that title was well known to the Jews. Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. I saw the, in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. And he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. They were well aware of the title Son of Man, this one who, who has dominion. All peoples, nations, and languages will serve him. His kingdom is an everlasting, uh, an eternal kingdom. And so this man who was blind, maybe he's a prophet. Uh, there's no one like him. He's the Son of Man. He's the son of man. He, he's the one who has an everlasting kingdom. He's the one who has an eternal kingdom. He's the one who all peoples, all tongues, all nations will bow down to. A full profession. And notice God's purpose, right? God's purpose, even in the most difficult situation, opening this man's eyes. The change. A completely different person. 
He didn't go back to the life he once lived. He's completely changed. And as a result of the change, the profession, a profession that comes in progress, he's a prophet. There's no one like him. He is Lord. And as a result of the purpose, the change, and the profession, he worships Christ. And he worshiped him. Now that word there for worship is in the connotation of somebody falling down before someone, falling down on their face before someone. Symbolizing, hey man, this person's greater, this person's above me, this person is, is somebody that should be served. You know, I know often, you know, we don't really do that here. We don't really fall down in our worship service, and sometimes I wish we would, but... Man, I hope that maybe in your own time, there are times when you just think about God, you think about Christ, you think about how he has purposed in your life, how he changed you, how, how you're professing him, and you just fall down before him because there is no one like him. There's no one like him. Verses 39 and 41 as we close. Jesus said, For judgment I came into this world that those who do not see may see. And those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard these things, and they said to him, Are we also blind? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no guilt. But now that you say we see, your guilt remains. As I said, Jesus opening this man's eyes illustrates something else, illustrates something deeper. Jesus opens up eyes spiritually. He opens up people's eyes to sin. In verse 41, if you were blind, you would have no guilt. That word there for guilt is the same word for sin. If you were blind, you would have no sin, sometimes translated as sin, guilt. You would have no sin, guilt. Now think about this. If we had no concept of light and darkness, if we had no concept of good and wrong, if we had no concept of sin, we wouldn't have guilt. But we do. We know we do wrong. We we know what's wrong, and we know that we do wrong regardless, and we know that, hey, we're sinful. We do wrong according to what God determines is right. In our passage, unfortunately, unlike the blind man, well, the person who was formerly blind, uh, the Pharisees, though they see... They know that they are wrong. They know that they need a Savior. They remain, they remain in the life they have lived. They refuse to come to Christ so as to have life. They do not acknowledge God's purpose. They do not uh, experience change in their life. They do not profess Christ. They do not worship Christ. Unlike this man who was born blind who sees the purpose, who experiences change, who professes Christ, and who falls down before him. I pray that you realize how blind you are. I pray that you come to Christ so you can see. You can as we stand and sing.